Sushwati wanted me to talk a bit on groundwater uh, rules and regulations as it comes along. I thought that I would add a little bit of rain water and I would add a little bit of the water and I would add a little bit of the water. My fascination with the, with the groundwater also comes from the fascination with the well. Uh, and we now have a Facebook group called Open Wells in India and, uh, and the world. So, for example, this well in Kolar. Now, the construct of water and groundwater is very important. The languaging that we do and the positioning of the problem. Just today, there was an article in the Hindu which says that there's fluoride in 10% of the uh, wells in uh, Karnataka, right? Now, that rhetoric has spread to Kolar and Chikbalapur. There were certain uh, numbers given. What it means is, uh, the government then says that Using the granularity, it paints a picture of the entire taluk or the entire district being fluoride affected. And then the follow-up is a net result is a 13,000 crore scheme to divert west flowing rivers to these places, Kolar and Chikbalapur, as drinking water to remediate fluoride. And the messaging of fluoride has gone because it has been presented in the media as the whole district and the whole state being affected with it. Whereas if you dive down to granularity, it may be that there are 10 habitations or 20 habitations which have fluoride or arsenic. It may be. And maybe the solutions are local and maybe they're not global. But if we position the granularity in a particular way, then the solutions also come the, that particular way and then causes major problems and drives you around. And clearly in Karnataka, the diversion of the west flowing rivers, the 13,000 crore project is coming with the rhetoric of fluoride in groundwater. And it's coming with the rhetoric of Kolar being depleted with groundwater, there being no groundwater at all in Kolar district and Chikbalapur district. These are adjoining districts. This is the district, which is 70-80 km far away. But if you go to Kolar, you will get such a river in which there is no water. And such a river in which there is no water in which there is no water. But this nobody will show. I haven't seen a full well and a clear water being shown in the media any time at all. It has never been seen. This is the problem with groundwater and it comes, as I go along, I will also sort of discuss this idea because groundwater is theoretically spoken of as a hidden resource, invisible resource, hidden resource. That is the talk, academic talk. Now, if it's talked about as a hidden resource, the well makes it a visible resource. And the well has stories to tell because it tells you about the capacity of that aquifer to hold water, that it had held water of a certain quality. So it says that that storativity is available. It is perhaps overuse and over extraction that has depleted it, but there is this possibility of it being filled up, provided certain conditions are met. So these, how do you capture stories around this would be as important as the policy document. This is Kolar, Devarai Samudra, very close to Mulbagal, about 30, 20 kilometers from, uh, from that particular place. <coughs> so uh, let me just sort of dive down into quickly explaining what rainwater harvesting is because uh, this is for people uh, who are going to deal with it as stories in their own cities and this is from an urban context and I'm explaining to you what rainwater harvesting in Bangalore looks like. Bangalore mein kaise kiya gaya, isko kaise samjha gaya aur kaise isko policy mein laya gaya aur law mein laya gaya. Pehli baat to hai that the factor affecting us was that we should not impact downstream. Upstream downstream conflict should not be there. That the entire rainwater falling on a place should not be captured by that place simply because the ground or land is owned. And therefore, we need to conceptualize as to how we deal with it. And the way to deal with it ecologically is to do it through biomimicry. That is to say that if the site was not built upon, what would have been the hydrological flows? And therefore, once the site is built upon, can we start to retain those hydrological flows? So the numbers come like this. As they come in Bangalore context, on average, कि जो 100 लीटर पानी गिरता है एक साइट पे यदि वो खाली साइट हो तो 15 लीटर सरफेस रनऑफ के जरिए जाता है नाले में जाता है 10 लीटर रिचार्ज होता है रिचार्ज होता है यानी एक मीटर के नीचे जाता है 10 लीटर और 75 लीटर 75 परसेंट ऑफ़ द वाटर स्टेस विथ इन द वन मीटर हॉराइज़न ऑफ़ उसके ऊपर घर आ गया या कोई बिल्डिंग आ गया, the surface runoff now becomes 90 लीटर्स, 15 से 90 चला गया, recharge 5 हो गया, 5 से 0 भी हो जाता है कभी-कभी क्योंकि पूरा built up हो जाता है और evapotranspiration का कोई chance ही नहीं है, only that the terrace is hot and whatever water falls on it evaporates, 
So the alteration is from 15 to 90, 10, 5, 75. The aim of rainwater harvesting is can we capture that 75, store it and reuse it or can we recharge that 75? That is the aim without affecting the natural recharge, in fact increasing the natural recharge and without affecting surface runoff. That was the overall discussion. And so the thematic scheme for the city as such was to get and deal with rooftop rainwater separately, water and stormwater drains separately and water falling on playgrounds and landscaped areas separately. And what do you do with each one of them? Well, those possibilities are there. Essentially two, storage or recharge. Filtration, necessary, not necessary, depending on the context of the catchment. So the law was then simply reduced to this particular number. Pura law was not a complex law. It was a two-line law. Chhat ke har square meter ke liye 20 liter storage ya recharge karna hai aapko. Aur yadi aapne apne site ko pave kiya, chhat ke alawa, baki ka jaga hai wahan pave kiya, to wahan per square meter aapko 10 liter storage ya recharge karna padega. Yadi recharge structure banai, to that will have to be 3 meters deep. And that was because you wanted to bypass the root zone of trees and plants and the clay layer which normally exists in 85% of Bangalore. That's all. So this is one of the simplest bylaws which is supposed to be self-read and self-regulated and acted upon by an informed citizenry which would understand what the law means for them. And so then there was this whole necessity to bring in a trained manpower, to bring in uh, skills, plumbing skills and all that which were part of the law necessary which are normally not, through in the, uh, not thought through in law making or policy making. What is the antecedent platform that you need to create for the law to be actualized? How do you measure outcomes and objectives? These were clear things that were needed. And how much, how much should science back it with understanding rainfall patterns, intensities, etc., etc. And so also the wording of it, every roof a catchment, that was the kind of thinking that you would articulate around it. So this city then created what is called a theme park, a rainwater harvesting theme park on one and a half acres. How many of you have seen the theme park? Good. Both are cheap. Five people are. That's right. That's great. But as a citizen uh, of this city, one should say that less than 1% of the city has actually gone there. Many reasons, but this availability is there. The theme park is a private public participation model. The government gave the land. Private sector guys help build the infrastructure and set up models there. But it's open for the people. It's a common pool resource. You can walk in any time, ask questions, get assistance, get drawings, and be able to be associated with trained plumbers and well diggers to implement it. So this is the 5th block. Mein. So this association needs to go and institutions need to be persuaded to think of communicating. Institutions are great at law making and policy making. Institutions are lousy at communicating. So how do you get a public outreach is as crucial to the bylaw to succeed as anything else, if not the most things. And so many technologies were developed. You know, porous pathways, Obi dikhaya gaya hai. green drains and so on. Stormwater drains. Why should stormwater drains be with brick and mud and so on and so forth. And the real benefit of rainwater harvesting, if it is only measured as water, which many studies do, perhaps we escape the real merit. The real merit is this, 750 crores of employment created, 750 crore rupee was invested in the economy mostly to create livelihoods for plumbers and well diggers. And it spurred innovation in the sense more than 40 different kind of filters came into the market because there was a market created and innovation was spurred. Now this is not realized by any institution because the water utility doesn't care a damn about employment creation. It doesn't care about innovation. The local government is, doesn't care about this. Really it's not in their mandate. So who has to care for it and how should it be structured remains the question. If a city wants to be self-dependent on water, if it wants not to draw water from rural settings, if it wants to be equitous and just, it has to think through many processes which now institutions are not capable of thinking. And so antecedent to that stormwater harvesting. Rainwater is from the individual sites. How do you move on into the public domain and start to capture water? These are through recharge wells. Recharge wells are typically 1 meter ke hote hai, diameter or 10 se 20 foot gehra. Or kai recharge well mein salana 10 lakh liter pani recharge ho jata hai. Ek recharge well se 10 lakh liter pani recharge ho jata hai aquifer mein. Conditions vary from place to place, but this is the average, the capacity is that. But who should incentivize recharge wells? How should it happen? 
Why should people put in water into the aquifer when they do not know where the water goes? The biggest impediment is this. People ask, I am putting water in the aquifer, where is it? But when the person puts water in the aquifer, he doesn't ask where the water is coming from. When the water is put in the aquifer, he asks where the water is coming from. So how do we understand this mindset and understand it? There are a lot of things that are in the church. So the push is to put people's money into it. In the, in, the, in the context of Bangalore, there was no incentive or subsidy or tax property rebate, nothing. You did this because it was for your own good, right? So that push was to put it into the private domain, also because of the reason that it was imagined that you would take care of a rainwater harvesting system better if it was within your property than if it was in public property, because the maintenance is not there. And there is no Indian word for maintenance. Ye bhi baat hai. Ki Bharatiya शब्द कोश में कोई भी भाषा में मेंटेनेंस के लिए कोई एक वो रख रखा वो सब जोड़ जाड़ के हम कर लेते हैं लेकिन मेंटेनेंस का एक्चुअली नहीं आता एंड सो एक्चुअली डिजाइनर्स हैव गोट इनटू इट स्टॉम वाटर ड्रेन्स हैव बीन डिजाइन्ड आर्किटेक्ट्स आर गेटिंग इनटू इट एंड इंजीनियर्स आर गेटिंग इनटू इट